So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw signs, because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for an eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of, the God, of God, that you believe in him who he ha whom he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So every three years, the lectionary gives us five weeks in John's gospel contemplating Jesus as the bread of life or the bread which comes down from heaven. It's a long time to preach on one metaphor or so it seemed to me the first time around, which happened to be my first year as a pastor. Being new, I opted to follow a suggested sermon series, and I will tell you it's the first and last time I intentionally preached a sermon series because it wasn't of me coming from God to my heart to share. And while the series was received well, it was a daunting beginning that left me wondering where to go from there. I clearly remember calling a friend of mine with a year, years more experience as a local pastor than I and saying, I got nothing. I, I, they're looking to me and already I've got nothing. I don't know where to go from here. Now, one might say that I was hungry and looking to be fed. And in that moment, I was fed through her prayers with me and for me. It was enough to fill me with confidence to continue. And this time around with these scriptures, with five weeks of bread, we're currently in week two, there's something to be said for staying the course and holding on, for trying on the bread of heaven as we abide in the word such that we can touch and taste and smell and see and hear God anew. Not as a sermon series per se, but as the lectionary leads us and we respond to Jesus asking us to dwell in him and take in that he is our bread of and for life. And it would be easy to get lost or caught in the literal bread of these scriptures, which is where the crowd in today's reading gets stuck. They're persistent in their pursuit of Jesus because they are hungry, and he has fed them once before. And now Jesus says, come to me, fill yourself with me, eat me, essentially, and never be hungry again. I don't know how that fell on their ears at the, at the time, but I find myself pondering questions like these when I hear those words. What does it mean to be hungry, not for food, but for God? Am I hungry? And if so, what am I hungry for? And if not, what is it that makes me full? Am I ashamed of my hunger? Does the idea of being full scare me? And what kinds of bread 
might I be substituting for Jesus? I will say that there are a couple of places that stand out in my life where being hungry manifested as this question, is this all there is? Meaning clearly hungry for something more. I was in a marriage where love expressed came out as I love you, but, and a whole series of things around that statement led to divorce because I could not imagine raising a child in the belief that this is what love looked like. In a career change, from doing something exceedingly well with a comfortable salary to working from the heart and trusting God was another place where I responded to, is this all there is? Where the divorce was concerned, I came from a family, I come from a family with a history of divorces and wanting more incurred a level of feeling shame at the time. Like, why isn't this enough? And why isn't this working? And what do I do now? Those career changes, those multiple leaps, leaps of faith that began when I left pharmacy to follow my heart meant navigating a fear of the unknown and the doubt of family and friends who could not understand how I could leave a 28-year career and a lucrative salary behind and my own living into what feeling full could look like. Looking back, I'm certain the driver for those major life changes was and still is living into, leaning into that hunger hunger, and fulfilling that hunger that Jesus describes. To be more, to do more, to feel joy and give love more. So in Jesus' words and my own answers to these questions, bread is, bread is clearly suddenly more than bread. Theologian and Episcopal priest Lauren Winner wrote, in calling himself the bread of life and not say creme brulee or caviar, Jesus is identifying with basic food, with sustenance, with attainable food that for centuries afterward would figure in protest efforts of poor and marginalized people. No one holds caviar riots. People riot for bread, for the basic sustenance. So to speak of God as bread is to speak of God's most elemental provision for us which prompted another question. Do I, do we feel in our gut that Jesus is elemental provision? Not the appetizer, not the dessert, not the occasional dietary supplement, but the essential everyday food without which I will starve and die? Am I, are we brave enough, self-aware enough to own that hunger and live into it? Because that's the essence of what Jesus invites the crowds to recognize. The hungers beneath their physical hunger. They're certainly hungry for literal bread. They're poor. Food is scarce. And they need to feed themselves and their families. And there's nothing wrong or substandard or unspiritual about that physical hunger. John's gospel narrative tells us clearly that Jesus tends to that need first without reservation or preconditions, for example, with five loaves and two fish. But he doesn't stop there. Instead, Jesus now asks these persistent crowds to look deeper, to examine the soul hungers that continue to drive them into his presence, hungers that only the bread of heaven could satisfy, hungers like the peace that passes understanding, connection, community, Love, trust, abiding, healing. Naming those hungers is a start, but it's quite another thing to really genuinely trust that Jesus will satisfy them. I know that in today's world, we can easily be caught up in all manner of things. Perpetual busyness, social media, books, movies, the 24-hour news cycle, exercise, chocolate, other people, and the list goes on. We know none of those things can satisfy that deep yearning that Jesus is speaking of today. And if and when they get in our the way of our communion with God, our own hungers continue. So what to do here? 
Jesus clearly invites us to fill ourselves with him, which means looking both within and beyond ourselves and trusting in him to fill us in all those ways. One way I know of is to look outward. For decades now, I've supported Heifer International and Habitat for Humanity with the belief that as people's basic needs are met in sustainable ways, their focus can then begin to shift from surviving to thriving. My prayer in giving in this way is that I somehow make a difference. And in the context of today's reading, perhaps this speaks to what Jesus means in his words, eat me. To say yes, to give over to the divine spark within, to fully accept what Jesus offers and let that spill over and out of us and forward. Lutheran minister Nadia Boltz Weber describes another perception that can also keep us from actually feasting on Jesus. She says, it's hard to accept not just that God welcomes all, but that God welcomes all of me and all of you. Even those parts within us that we wish to hide, the part that cursed at our children this week or drank alone or has a problem with lying or hates our body or whatever it might be for you or me. That part within us that suffers from depression and can't admit it or is too fearful to give our money away or is riddled with shame over our sexuality or cheats on taxes or, again, all these parts of us, all these parts, whether ours or another's, that we wish Jesus had the good sense to not welcome at his table. All of these are invited to taste and see that the Lord is good. All of these fed and filled. All of these parts that Jesus invites in so that we will be full enough that our attention turns entirely to the love of God made manifest in him to satisfy our hunger, to move the needle from is this all there is to knowing and living abundantly, filled from that cup, that love and relationship that spills into us and all around us when we say yes. Because Jesus knows our nature all too well our fear of making a mistake, of being held accountable when we're not sure of ourselves, of taking a wrong turn, of post-choice remorse. Our fear of having to justify ourselves somehow to validate the directions we decide to take. Our fear of rejection, of getting lost somewhere and not finding our way back. Jesus knows these things about us and begins with this very basic thing in offering just himself which in turn is really a relationship with he and with God. The very meaning of believing embedded in his statement, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. Jesus reminds us that the word made flesh is about being in relationship with him, but even more, it's about leaning into, about trusting in just what that relationship means. Jesus is so much more than creed or good example or teacher. He is food for us. So to taste and see that the Lord is good, Jesus invites us to step beyond our barriers into a willingness to truly eat, to take him into ourselves day after day after day by setting down those things that distance us from a moment by moment, God first, God focused, God sighting life. It is an invitation that never ends. In his book, Sunday Dinner, William Willimon says this. The table is spread and all is now ready. The church points you to the table, the Lord's table, and says, There is no better time to get together than now. No better place than here. And like the crowd surrounding Jesus, we come today with our own version of, Lord, give us this bread always. Consider these words 
from the hymn. Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up, and make me whole. And so he does. Amen and amen.